So the debate that's been held at this conference and has been uh, a debate that has been running for the last few years is whether you should run a captive shared services or look for an outsourced provider to provide those services. In many ways, that's the wrong debate. So what's really important in terms of the way your back office in finance operates is how the business processes are managed and how, uh, how, how much discipline is brought to the organisation in terms of executing those. The relationship between the business and IT, because that's an interface that, that can create a lot of inefficiencies uh, and when it works well can create a huge amount of value. And looking at business process and data. And I'll come back to data in terms of how that provides additional value to the business. So it's very important that the debate's held in the right way and that when people are looking at how to change the finance function, that they relate what the finance function is trying to do in terms of supporting the business and that whatever the decisions they make about the back office within finance are consistent with the business objectives. When you look at the, the uh, natural uh, conflict in terms of priorities around do I outsource for lower cost or to gain access to skills that I don't have? Do I set up a captive to try and control or get under, get under control and, and, and improve my current processes in IT? Uh, and in that, should I invest in IT to get greater further automation? There's a, th there is a natural tension between the, well, I can invest in IT, I can reduce the amount of activity, therefore I'd lower the cost base to a potential BPO provider. I think, again, it's important to come back to what are you actually trying to achieve with your finance function? We look at uh, uh, APA take, take accounts payable as an example. No business will compete on how cheaply it can post a transaction, uh, uh, a supplier invoice in AP. There's an enormous value in uh, understanding the spend, especially in big organisations, category spend, in terms of up-to-the-minute information, knowing by category what's spent with whom, on what contract, with what discounts, and how that's managed on a global basis. Surprisingly, very few organisations can, can do that. So if you create a debate about whether or not you're going to look our, uh, own and manage your own AP function versus somebody else uh, uh, doing it for you, in terms of the captive and the outsource debate, you're actually missing the major value that it can provide within the organisation. And that's what I mean about focusing the discussion in the right topics. Having said that, one of the uh, topics that you would raise with a potential outsource provider is what additional value can you bring in terms of looking at wh whichever processes you're considering uh, uh, in terms of access to their skills and some of the additional uh, benefits that they could actually provide. If you think about People talk about world-class processes, um, and there's some, there's some quite hackneyed phrases around the advisory space, around the outsourcing space. People talk about transformation, innovation, world-class. All these words and phrases are bandied about um, with impunity and without necessarily relating to what are we trying to be good at or what are we trying to achieve. So if, if you look at what a good business process looks like, then the devil is in the detail. There's no, um, I was going to say there's no kudos in terms of running good business processes. I think the kudos is, in, is increasing, uh, but it's discipline. It's, it's, to some extent, it's just a grind. So do I book the transaction in the right place every time I do it so that when we add it up that the numbers make sense without having to do any ma manipulation? Am I able to compare costs across the world and therefore take the best advantages in terms of our supplier rela relationships? Do I actually understand who my top 10 customers are in terms of revenue and margin? And does that margin alter depending on the products that I'm selling or the services that I'm selling to them or the markets in which I'm, I'm servicing them? These are the questions that finance should be helping the business answer. The business processes should be run to allow that to happen. So when we talk about compliance to a business process, it's not acceptable, I don't think, anymore uh, to be uh, uncompliant, non-compliant with some of the um, protocols or, or, or um, uh, the, the rules around business processes. So if you have a product, you book it to the right part of the product hierarchy. If you have a customer, they go in the right, the right box and that you can add that customer together above market. And then what the business processes does is then it starts to enable the business to take advantage of scale and complexity and, and actually the, the way it operates. Too often we are in the, where should we put it? 
and who, sh who should operate it rather than what is the value we can create from really, I was going to say world class, but I'm going to say really well run business processes. So we had a debate during the, uh, during the G6 discussion uh, just now about overstating the value of shared services or outsourcing and understating what's required in terms of, people call it the retained organisation or the bits that the customer or the client still does. And people use terms like end-to-end -end processor or a holistic view. What we're talking about is understanding the origin of the, of the transaction at the beginning of a process to the last activity, which is normally the accounting en uh, entry at, at the end of the process. I think many people go into these uh, discussions thinking that either shared services or BPO is a panacea for solving all the business process issues. It is simply one element and there's a whole range of other uh, elements that, are, that influence whether an organisation can run their business processes effectively and whether they can get the value from that. So the behavioural change within the organisation, whether outsourced or, or captured shared services, the behavioural change is fundamental. So you cannot have uh, supplier invoices without purchase orders or goods receipts. You can't simply uh, make up trading terms in terms of customers and cut invoices uh, that, uh, that don't relate to contracts or agreed price lists. So on the one hand, uh, we, so we have sold shared services and outsourcing in the past in terms of taking away the mechanics, the, the boring, if you like, the boring mechanics of, of away from the business and allowing the salespeople to do their job. But actually what we're saying now is that big global organisations want to run consistently. They want a degree of control over both the sales activities and the procurement activities and many other activities too. And they see shared service and outsourcing as an instrument to actually gain control and compliance over that process. And that's a good outcome. That's, that's a good outcome. But it's difficult to achieve. So there's a question about how, how deep a relationship we have with our clients and f the duration of the relationship in terms of uh, a, a deal in the BPO example or in terms of setup of a, a, of a captive shared services. Um, so there's, I think there's a philosophy. It's very clear that uh, quite often in projects and, as people describe them, transformational deals, uh, the, the governance and the measurement of the benefits is more on a milestone be uh, basis. So when we finally got the last country or the last operating company into shared services or into the outsource deal, then we're done. And that's not the case. It's the, 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 the exercise is complete when the benefits are actually achieved. And uh, I would argue for the, um, uh, for the management in the, in the client, as well as for people like myself who are advising, that we ought to be held accountable for the benefits and not for simply hitting the milestones. And we are always happy to talk about uh, uh, structuring uh, the way we, we charge our fees related to the outcome rather than simply to the inputs and the activities. And I think philosophically, focusing on, clearly focusing on what are the benefits of doing these things will help some of the debate earlier in the process too. Uh, and I guess on the last point, one of the questions is, uh, why, if I'm looking to save money and generate value for my organisation, why am I paying consultants to hang around longer just to see if the benefits accrue? And I, and I think that's not what we're saying. I think what we're saying is that uh, the relationship is over a very longer period. The, uh, the uh, commercials may be based more around the outcome and the benefits being achieved than simply the inputs and the time and effort. Um, so whether we're uh, physically present or whether we're simply, we maintain the relationship and continue to a point where we can recognise the benefits, I think those, those, those are different things. I'm a great uh, advocate of focusing on the benefits and holding people accountable, us and everybody accountable uh, for those outcomes. I would say one point is that that does change the dynamic between advisors and clients because when we're held accountable for the outcomes there's a, there's a bit of a sharper edge to the conversations and I think that's a good thing.